I set up Blitz because there wasn't a magazine that I wanted to read around. Um, there were music magazines like um, NME, uh, Melody Maker, Sounds for Boys. There was absolutely nothing aimed at people like myself and my friends. I wanted to read a, a magazine that was aimed at both girls and boys, but not aimed down at them, I mean written by them and for them. And I suppose that's where Blitz came in. So in 1979, I had no money. I was a student, I was 19 years old. I decided to set up um, Blitz magazine. The subjects were going to be music, fashion, design, art, theatre, photography, general sort of media and arts, uh, which wasn't available to, to Irish group at all at the time. I obviously created the, the actual magazine on my bedroom floor um, by sending off the typesetting, sticking it all together, having the, the, the plates made, etc. It could take three weeks from start to finish to actually get a page ready for printing. Collectively, Blitz the Face and ID formed a new breed of what was called style magazines, um, a completely new genre of magazines. It was a range of topics. We would be interviewing um, film celebrities, music celebrities, politicians, a, a brown-eyed, curly brown-haired Madonna who'd just come over from America. It was a man's world. Publishing was a man's world, definitely. So I was seen, I suppose, as a, a young upstart. I remember going to see a bank manager with a business plan. Uh, my partner, Simon Tesla, was with me and um, we presented this plan. I asked him lots of questions and he came back to Simon with the answers. I was shocked and humiliated and it happened quite a lot. But on the other hand, the good thing about being a young 19, 20 year old starting a business is that it attracted a lot of press publicity. Um, Blitz magazine won awards quite fast. The fashion pages of Blitz were very unusual and very creative. Um, we had an amazing fashion editor called Ian R. Webb and he had visions um, for fashion that weren't seen anywhere else. He would have babies wearing amazing designer outfits. He would have down and out tramps wearing um, designer outfits. He would have models wearing non-designer outfits. It was a whole eclectic mix of, of exciting things. It was amazing the amount of people who wanted to work uh, for Blitz magazine. My approach was very much about um, whatever designers I liked um, that were interesting and exciting. So within Blitz magazine you had you know, Lee Bowery and Rachel Auburn and Body Map who were all mates of mine from the club scene but I also featured people like Jean Muir, um, who was a, you know, an icon of classicism. Um, but, but anything really that mixed, and a lot of the clothes also were from charity shops and things we just sort of found. The ideas for shoots came from pretty much everywhere. Um, I could be at home at the weekend and an old movie would come on TV. I remember um, seeing one, one Sunday afternoon a film called Pandora and the Flying Dutchman and then went in on Monday morning and said, we have to do a Spanish matador story. Um, and, and did a whole story based around that. The designer denim jacket project, as it became, started as just an editorial idea, another idea for another shoot. Um, and again, I think probably it was about taking that classic, iconic item of clothing um, and thinking, oh, that's a really, you know, we all have a denim jacket. We gave him free reign, so he came to us with this idea, I want to take the Levi's denim jacket and give it to 22 top international and up-and-coming designers and see what they do with it. He went off and he gave a jacket to Catherine Hamlet. He gave a jacket to Body Map. He gave a jacket to Jasper Conran. He, he gave a jacket to Hermes. They made very expensive scarves that only the Queen would and Margaret Thatcher would wear. So we had John Galliano, uh, Stephen Jones, who made hats. I mean, what on earth was Stephen Jones going to do with a jacket? I had no idea, but anyway. Um, Jean Muir, Zandra Rhodes, Paul Smith, Vivian Westwood. Um, a whole range of different designers. 
When he brought the images into the office and we looked at them, I just thought, this is amazing. So we published them in our issue of Blitz. It was our um, July 1986 edition. And I just said, no, this is too good just for this. You know, these are amazing jackets. What are we going to do with them afterwards? We're not going to have them hanging up in the offices. We've got to do something really big with this. Let's try and sell the jackets and raise money for charity. I went to see the um, Prince's Trust, who were really keen. I then went to uh, touted around a few theatres in central London and thought, if we could actually have a stage show, auction the jackets, and then they go on display at the V&A, that would be a dream come true. And that's exactly what we did. Yes, it was, it was just the one show on the one night, but the atmosphere was electric. It was so exciting. It was like one of our Blitz parties, and uh, we did have a lot of Blitz parties. And different people did different performances in a way. I suppose it was like performance art. Fantastic um, cast of celebrities from Boy George to Patsy Kensett. Uh, we had reading by Daniel Day-Lewis. Lou Bowery modeled his own jacket and did this spoof fall on stage. The Blitz exhibition was the major three-month exhibition at the V&A that summer. It then went on to the Louvre, to, it travelled to the uh, Musée des Arts Décoratifs. It went to Stockholm, it went to Australia and to Barney's in New York. I think it's, it is very easy to become nostalgic about one's own youth and the period that you were in. Um, but I would like to hope that the legacy of, of what we did then was to inspire um, young people to push the boundaries, to kick over the traces, to do their own thing and scare me a bit, you know, do something that scares me in the way that I think we scared the establishment back then.